Hello, everybody, and welcome to another lecture of the Elements of Sustainability series. Today's topic is one that we are increasingly seeing mentioned in the news and social media, and while as a concept it is relatively simple to grasp, it can get quite complex as we look closer and see all the moving parts and its full scope. Uh, today, it is a pleasure to have Dr. Chertow lifting the curtain a little bit for us during her lecture on circular economy and industrial ecology, closing the loops along the value chain. Uh, Dr. Marianne Chertow is a professor of industrial environmental management at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. She also has faculty appointments at the Yale School of Business and the National University of Singapore. Her research and teaching focus on industrial ecology, business environment issues, waste management, circular economy, and urban industrial systems. She is most interested in networks of companies that share physical resources across their boundaries, what has been themed as industrial symbiosis. Prior to Yale, Professor Chertow spent 10 years in environmental business and state and local government. Recently, Professor Chertow was U.S. representative to the launch of the G7 Alliance on Resource Efficiency. She served for two years as the elected president of the Inter International Society for Industrial Ecology, her scholarly society. Professor Chertow currently serves on the board of directors of the Alliance for Research in Corporate Sustainability, the board of directors for TerraCycle US Inc., and the external advisory board of the Center for Energy Efficiency and Sustainability at Ingersoll Rand. Thank you, Dr. Chertow, for being part of the series. It is a privilege to have you today. The floor is yours. Happy Earth Day, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here to talk about the circular economy and industrial ecology, all about closing loops. Now, when I think about closing loops by way of introduction, I think of my early manufacturing career. What you see in this picture is me at 10 years old. My father is running for the city council in Syracuse, New York. And what my whole neighborhood has done is get together and take all these yarn loops and turn them into potholders, which as you can see, is a fundraising device for my father's campaign. So it turns out I raised about $14.50 that day. I'm not sure it paid for the whole campaign, but it certainly made me the person I am today in the sense that uh, we were manufacturing. As you can see, there's the loom. Uh, we were getting involved in the community. We were doing some business and fundraising. And so in many ways, I think of myself as a loop closer for a long, long time. Let me give you a more formal introduction to me and to my talk. Uh, today, we're really focusing on physical resources, especially materials, energy, water, and waste. And what we wanna do in the beginning is to lay out the sense of the resources, the loop closing, and how these concepts integrate and then I'll talk specifically about industrial ecology and the circular economy and how they are tied to business and to the overall broad topic of resource management. And then I wanna look at environmental sustainability and how it's included but also excluded from value chains and supply chains and to also review how these concepts are evolving. Finally, I have some uh, examples that I think are really uh, illustrative of the sorts of com concepts that I'll be talking about. How do these things start to fit together in different ways? How, do we, how are they combining? And how are they turning out to make uh, the, the, the uh, business more sustainable? So let's just get a sense of the scale of resources that are used to make large things. What you see in this picture comes to me from Pratt & Whitney, a manufacturer of uh, jet engines. And what you see here is that even if um, with so much weight coming out of the ground, a million pounds of ore, 
that's how much it takes to make a 10,000 pound engine. So um, here is an example of the amount of material that doesn't get used uh, because it's not what you need and it goes, usually goes out as waste. This is, there's no advantage to the company this way. They would love to reduce that buy to fly ratio of 10 to one, but it's a challenge because uh, the ore comes out of the ground, it has to be processed, and so there are also a lot of losses and that co cost the company money as well. Food also has a high level of uh, embedded resources. What it takes to make a big piece, a 500 gram piece of cheese, about a pound. And what this slide shows us is that 2,500 liters of water, about 650 gallons, goes into making a one pound piece of cheese. How is that possible? Well, we're not just thinking about the cheese itself, but we're really going all the way back in the chain to see how did we raise grain for the cows, um, how are we uh, sheltering the cow and how much wa all the water that the cows are drinking, uh, the, the transport. When you count everything up from the beginning to the cheese, then that's why we're seeing such large numbers there. And that is important to just be cognizant of how many resources go into things when uh, they're being made. E let's take even a bigger picture look uh, Erica mentioned that I had spoken at the G7 uh, to their group on resource efficiency when it was launched. And the question is, how much of all waste is really wasted? What you see here on the left column is the US, and what you see on the right is the whole world. And look at the numbers today for energy loss. Uh, we waste 60% of our energy in the US economy, largely due to the thermodynamic losses that come from fossil fuels. And um, in the globally, it's less, but there's still a huge amount of energy loss. Imagine you know, losing uh, a, a whole third of what you hoped you, that you had produced. Food is very similar. Uh, food waste has become a huge issue out there. 40% of the, all the food that's produced is never eaten and so is wasted, both in the US and globally. And water, too, is a resource that has become very much in play. And sadly, as you see around the world, one of the problems is just leaky pipes in cities. You can lose up to 60% or even more of your water supply. And in the US, the figure that I found is that 18% of water that's already been treated is wasted. So you can see the scale of losses the scale of still of our inefficiency and how they're so much larger than we might think. Let's look at one other area where we see uh, huge losses uh, downstream, you know, after the use of the, of, the, uh, of the product, and that's with textiles. So what we see, according to US EPA, is that 85% of our textiles that we're finished with end up in landfills end up as disposed. And only 15% have been recycled in the last year that we had, 2015. And you can see on the chart how, how much is landfilled, how much is combusted, and so forth. It's, and this is a very typical number across the world to have this high an amount of, of used clothing be going to disposal. Now, I really introduced this talking about resources, and I'd like to add another layer of complexity. Here, back in the 1980s, looking at a periodic table, you see this is the number of resources in green that it took to make main electronics, major electronics back in the 1980s. Now let's look at how much, how many elements are being used in the 1990s. You can look at the 2000s, and you see that most of the periodic table is in play here. And finally, in the 2010s, even more, you see the rare earth metals at the bottom. And so you get a con concept not only of how much waste there is or how many resources are, are leaking, but also this more complex system where we are looking at specific materials to create the things that we want in our modern technological society. 
all the features of a cell phone. Imagine what a cell phone was like in the 1980s, and you can imagine that in the 2010s, it's a much more uh, resource-intensive device. So um, this is why I'm so fascinated and, and happy to talk about the circular economy and industrial ecology, because both of them are concerned with managing the physical resources of our society. And usually when I say physical resources, I'm talking broadly about materials, water, and energy. But this is really foundational. We have to understand what we have, how much we can um, use, and, and what other options are to be able to meet our resource needs. So let's start with the circular economy. It's not a new concept, although it's very popular right now, and it's an important one. As you can see from this chart, a lot of our loop closing by that name goes back to the 70s. Uh, in 1989, industrial ecology comes along. Several other important uh, ways to achieve a loop closing and a circular economy, cradle to cradle in 1991. Swedish law, the German law, and the Japanese law are often credited for being real precursors to what we have today. They were based, both of them, on the need to find places to dispose waste and have names like Cycle and Waste Management Act and uh, establishing a sound material cycle. So you can see uh, how these came about. Um, in, in 2009, we have both Korea's uh, green growth strategy, which has been significant, and in, two, also, in 2009 also, China's circular economy promotion law a very broad and specific law that takes industry by industry what these uh, companies should do in order to help to achieve a less resource intensive, more circular economy. Famously, the, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation came, up, came about in 2010, and that has, uh, that's a foundation in the UK that has really led the charge on getting the word out there about circular economy and especially among businesses and uh, policymakers, so that we can start to take the scientific ideas we have and turn them into ways that people can use them in our everyday life. You see that uh, there's an interesting book here called Establishing a Resource Circulating Society in Asia by uh, colleagues in Japan, and how exciting to think about not only an economy, but a whole society. And now in 2015, you see the European Union's action plan for the circular economy. It's being talked about every day in 2019 and figuring out the ways by which it can be fully implemented. So a lot of attention, a lot of excitement, and a lot of possibilities. For a more formal uh, definition of a circular economy, I turn to this article um, by colleagues in uh, the Netherlands and in the UK. Uh, and when they talk about a circular economy, I like a lot of these words. They've, they've come to mean so much to me. Uh, it's a regenerative system. And what you see are that the way resource input and energy are and losses are minimized is by these interesting words, slowing, closing, narrowing material and energy loops. And how do you do this? It says, and we'll come back to it, um, long lasting design, maintenance, repair, reuse, remanufacturing, refurbishing. And uh, this is very interesting to me. When we think about sustainability, the last very you know, broad concept that we've all uh, been interested in is, that is much more about not only the environmental performance, not only the economic performance, but it puts this all together, you know, social, economic, environmental. And that's implicit in the circular economy, but I really find that circular economy is kind of more of a economic concept. You're really talking about eliminating the extra resources and that leakage out of the system. With respect to industrial ecology, my home discipline, uh, you can see that we're very much about the study of the flows of materials and energy, not only in industry, but really in all of consumer activities. We're all, and we're not interested just in counting those flows, but we want to look at their effects on the environment. And it isn't enough just to stick to the technical side. 
but we also need to look at how politics, regulation, social factors influence the flow, use, and ultimately the transformation of resources, how we make things, how we make cities, um, how we make um, uh, you know, large industries and so forth when we combine everything together. So um, here's an interesting industrial ecology concept writ large. You know, a word that we use for tracking the material and energy flows is to talk about metabolism. Think of the analogy to the human body, where when you think of your own metabolism, you're putting stuff into your body, um, stuff is coming out of your body, uh, some materials are stored, some expelled, and so forth. And so uh, take this to the level of a whole company. Take this to the level of Toyota, for example. And um, they are list on the left all their inputs. In the middle is their production process, all the different stages. And on the right are those emissions. CO2 you see, um, other gases, um, what happens with waste, what are the total volumes, what's the final disposed and reused. And so in this way, we can start to measure uh, the impacts of the economy, sort of this uh, metabolism and how that plays out. So um, a formal approach to a lot of this, uh, and I expect many of you know about uh, life cycle assessment, is a reminder that industrial ecology is looking at the whole system from the extraction and the processing at the upstream level um, distribution and use of products. And then the key thing is when the consumer gets a hold of it. That's the, what we call the use phase, separates the upstream from the downstream. And um, what we can really focus on here is look across all of these stages and try to figure out uh, with a lot of software and a lot of modeling. Um, what the highest environmental impacts are and where they occur. And in that way, this is very useful for companies who are doing any kind of production and services because they can see where the biggest needs are and address those through improvement analysis. So um, this model of life cycle assessment is very much inherent in, life, in uh, industrial ecology and circular economy thinking. Here's one example from life cycle you can see that in making Rolls-Royce uh, engine, the manufacturer is high in, higher in uh, energy use. The testing is low, but the use phase, when you and I get um, or ride in the airplane or drive our automobile, is really quite high. Um, it's a thousand times all the other stages because this is a log scale on the CO2 emissions. So, uh, how important it is to have this knowledge and even more detailed knowledge about where change can come. So with this introduction to resources, I want to look at some of the business questions uh, that have been raised uh, through talking about industrial ecology and a circular economy. And let's turn to um, Harvard Business School's Professor Michael Porter. Porter, of course, is best known for his work on a competitive strategy and the importance of that. And I think this outlook helps to explain uh, a, a little bit more about when we talk about value chains. So he tells us that competitive advantage cannot be understood by looking at the firm as a whole. We have to break it down into pieces in order to figure out how we can do each piece better and unite those pieces. So in the second bullet, it says that um, the advantage stems from many discrete activities. And here's a little list that companies do, designing, producing, marketing, delivering. Um, and each of these contributes to the strategic position of the firm and can be a, 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 an opportunity for differentiation as well. So uh, Porter then goes on to talk and introduce the, the concept uh, in some detail back in the 1980s, of a value chain. So what is a value chain? Why is it important? It's exactly the way to look and break down into pieces uh, what companies do 
to get their products in and out um, and satisfy customers. So think of it as a business model and it's looking at the whole chain. So let's look at this value chain concept as uh, presented by Michael Porter. What you see here are uh, several primary activities in the, in the picture, going from inbound logistics to operations. So inbound logistics is receiving products, procuring them and so forth. Um, thinking about inventory, the operations are actually making, turning the raw materials into finished products or services. Uh, and outbound logistics is how do we get our product to the, to the customer. Marketing and sales is an important part of that. Uh, how can you make this more attractive and promote it and price it and so forth? And finally, uh, the service, which suggests that um, how do you maintain the product? What kind of customer service arrangements should you make? Um, and so forth. So these are the primary activities of the value chain. And then there's the support activities uh, up on the top. So the firm infrastructure refers to the accounting, the public relations, the hiring, and so forth. Uh, it would be under the human resource management, the second one. Um, technology addresses not only what are coming technologies, but how do we use technologies to enhance specific products. And finally, the stage of procurement. And again, um, this is all about that all-important part of scanning the market and knowing how to bring in um, whatever it is that you need and to make decisions about these purchases, how to do this economically. So think of this value chain as kind of a, a business model because the value chain focuses on the company and how are we gonna do things. It's, it's, a kind of a, it's an economic and business strategy concept. How, are, how will we procure our materials? How will we do our manufacturing? How will we do our marketing? Uh, in contrast, uh, the use of the term supply chain comes from the operations management field. And so it's more concerned with specifics about um, how will we get this whole complex network together? Um, how will we organize the people and the activities and the information flows? Um, and then looking at the bullets on the slide, uh, you want, you need, the goal is to produce and deliver the final product, and it's got to be at the right place at the right time. And secondly, uh, you're going all the way back, not only to the suppliers, but to the supplier's suppliers, not only to your customer, but to the customer's customer, and trying to think about um, all of the activities in that. So um, you can see uh, many of the activities on the left. On the right, you see the product flow in red is going out from the firm to the suppliers and the customers. And then information flows, uh, strategy uh, requirements for the firms are coming back in. All of this, again, a very dynamic process. So um, what, I, what I think you sh we should focus on is the fact that one comes from business and is more about the individual company, whereas um, the supply chain is more about how do we do it? How do we run those operations in an, in an efficient way? Now, another difference I think we should identify is that companies see like to do things in uh, different ways and have come to do it that way. These are two uh, typical theories about firms. The first one is called the resource-based view of the firm, and there, the company feels that its strength comes from its ability to uh, manage resources and that it knows how to do things uh, internally and to play to its strengths. And so when they want to go to a supply chain or they're, they're internally oriented, asking the question, you know, what, su what suppliers do we need to meet our objectives? With respect to the resource dependency theory on uh, the second bullet, um, here, uh, the firm is more engaged with the outside world. Maybe they don't have their own R&D and so forth. They're really talking to suppliers to find out uh, what are the latest things. And so in this case, uh, they're more dependent on external par uh, parties. And, um, and so they're always uh, scanning the market in that way. So different approaches, uh, but they get to the same place of trying to deliver something as best you can uh, on time and to the right place. So um, I also wanna make the point that these uh, supply chain questions 
are really even broader uh, in many ways than the diagram suggests with their focus on companies and industries because supply chains affect the whole environment. And I couldn't resist putting in this, uh, this picture about the Aral Sea in Central Asia. Um, sadly, it used to be the fourth largest lake in the world. And in the 70s, it just started leaking water. Um, and now it's reached a new low because of uh, irrigation. And as the water gets lower, there's drought. And what you see from the satellite imagery uh, on the left is when there's still a lot of water in the lake, not as much as there used to be. But by 2014, what you see is that the eastern basin of the, uh, of the lake is now completely dry. You know, boats run up on it and they're completely not in water. So uh, let's also consider this broader picture as we think about value chains and supply chains. Another lesson, I guess, is um, that supply chain mistakes can be very costly to companies, um, especially to, you know, it's a reputational issue. And I don't want to suggest that Sony is, is, is in any way uh, a, a, a bad actor. I, I just want to make a supply chain point, which is that um, the, uh, the Sony PlayStation, uh, you know, Hundreds of thousands of them, millions of them were being brought into Europe for Christmas sales one year. And, but you're not allowed to have any cadmium in your system when you enter the EU. And the Dutch government found out that there was indeed um, some a, a cadmium switch back into the construction of the PlayStation. And honestly, uh, it came as a surprise to them. Um, it's hard to know everything that goes into a, into a product especially when, um, you know, there are 6,000 suppliers. And so the company had to go all the way back into their supplier and their supplier's supplier uh, to find where was that switch coming from and how could they get it removed. It was a very expensive cost to the company, $130 million. And of course, a lot of kids were deprived of their brand new PlayStations. Sony's now a leader in this sort of thing, but it's just a reminder um, of the importance on the business side. Here's another uh, way of thinking about some of these things. In this slide from McKinsey, we're looking at one industry, the consumer packaged good companies. And what the um, pie chart on the left shows you is that half of the value of the company is from current cash flows. But let's remember the other half, actually 51%, is what your shareholders are betting on. And this is the present value of your expected growth. So shareholders are betting on your future growth. And what it says on the right-hand side is this growth is being tipped away uh, owing to sustainability factors. And companies have to be so concerned about them. Not, not only the business factors, but with carbon emissions. You know, of course, sustainability looks at labor laws, you know, deforestation, all of these things, the water shortages, the health issues, and work, worker safety issues erode what could be your future profits and how important it is to keep up on these um, and to be able to address them to maintain a shareholder value. So when we put some of these ideas together, you can see how greening the supply chain has become an important concept in the last 10 or 15 years. And um, the importance of this concept is that we start to introduce these ways to address the very things that we've been showing some concern about. What are the impacts for sustainability throughout the supply chain? Um, how can you design the product differently? Um, how, you know, what transportation mechanisms can you use and what can you do for recycling and disposal? Right now, the value chains that we've looked at don't really address this, but companies have certainly been addressing it for a, a long time. The questions about corporate sustainability. And what I wanted to emphasize here is that why? Why are buyer companies having to follow um, the whole green supply chain more 
And the issue is that if a main company like a Sony um, has set certain standards now and certain policies that reflect their own commitments to um, environmental sustainability, if the suppliers aren't following those standards, then they, the company, the main company that's employing them uh, may be using products that don't even meet their own standards. And so this whole idea of greening the supply chain, even without regulation uh, necessarily, just goes back and back into trying to maintain the integrity of the supply chain uh, for a manufacturing company. So uh, let me try to summarize this part of the talk by saying that actually um, this is a diagram that comes from operations management. And what you see in stage one is really concern about the company itself and its own internal coordination. That used to be the, the biggest part. And in stage two, we see that the um, upstream supply chain, the, the top part of the diagram, the darker gray, now includes supplier network, and then the uh, company itself, then the customer needs. And that is, uh, that is an advance in thinking about uh, supply chains rather than just thinking about individual companies. But we're even beyond that, of course, because what do we do at the end of product life with so many of the things that we've already looked at, right? Clothing and so forth and metals. Um, and so this uh, now starts to account for the broader supply chain. It, you can see that the lower part of the diagram focuses on the reverse uh, supply chain, the downstream section, where you try to bring things back they may be the clothes that didn't sell that year. They may be the scrap metals and so forth. And how could you start to manage those in what the operations research people call closed loop supply chains and try to get everything reused, uh, recycled, recovered, whatever you can recover to go back into the supply network. Um, and so that's where we get this idea of a closed loop supply chain. Let me give that a little bit more definition. It's both the forward supply chain and the reverse supply chain. And there are many ways to close these loops. Um, you could make, you may be able to use the whole product again um, by repairing your toaster, you can repair that. Um, you may just be able to recover some components is, is typical in a lot of the auto industry and so forth. And even if you can't get the component, maybe you can reuse the materials. So that's what happens in these closed loop supply chain concept. I want to add to that because this is close to a lot of what we talk about with circular economy, that in this chart, you're beginning with raw material, you're moving to the primary producer and the manufacturer, and now you start to see these loops. And what I want to say is that the larger the loop, and here you see the largest loop is recycling, the greater the cost to society because the recycled material has to go back through all these steps whereas the shorter loops for remanufacturing, for a repair and reuse um, are more conserving of the original materials that went into those products. And, and that's a, a key concept that uh, we're seeing much more uh, taken seriously these days. Uh, remanufacturing, for example, turns out to be very profitable for companies um, and uh, more emphasis in different parts of the world on some of these different uh, choices for reclamation. So uh, let me just try to put this all together with this uh, last uh, <clears throat> look at this supply chain, uh, value chain, green supply chain. Uh, putting these pieces together, we really capture a, a whole systems view of resource flows. The purple in the top of this diagram adds some other ideas, regulation, performance standards, um, what constraints do you have on your materials? And what if you can't get to a certain material? Um, you have to have plans for that as part of the company's goals. And then you see your basic supply chain, raw materials, manufacturing. And then at, at the end of the chain on consumption, some materials going to the landfill and the incinerator. But now we've built in all those reverse supply chain uh, opportunities, as you can see. Uh, that we've already talked about, remanufacturing and recycling, build in design for environment into the front end, life cycle into the front end, so that you can use your, uh, be more efficient with the end of life. 
uh, materials. So now I'd like to offer several examples that bring together some of the concepts that we've already talked about and uh, how they're being used in this chain concept, whether it's value chain, supply chain, uh, green supply chain, closed loop supply chain. I think they're all important and add a little bit of insight into how we, how we manage these interdependencies and bring them together and find new opportunities as well. So I'm gonna start with something that uh, I'm very involved in in my uh, academic work. It's part of industrial ecology called industrial symbiosis. And um, the basic concept of industrial symbiosis, uh, I defined it, you can see in 2000, is the idea that one company's waste can become another company's feedstock. And um, here uh, I define it as an approach to competitive advantage. So there's advantages for companies to doing this, and um, let's take a closer look at that. The most famous example by far of the uh, industrial symbiosis is in Kallenborg, Denmark, a small city there. And um, what you see in this diagram is that over time, you don't see the time passing, but uh, I'm telling you over time uh, from the uh, oil refinery and the power station, getting together in the 1960s to find a common water supply came a lot more cooperation across firms. So you could use the heated water that comes from the power plant to make a fish farm, and a young entrepreneur did that. You can use, reuse fly ash. You see all these different complexities. Um, and I think of this as a localized supply chain because you're getting a lot of new supplies from a neighbor, really. And um, this can be more efficient, less transportation. Um, and at the same time, it builds community because people get to know each other um, in a small community. Maybe they already knew each other. Uh, there's a lot of social capital. The children play soccer together and so forth. And over time, what we see in Kallenborg is even a much denser by 2012 um, relationship, more partners coming in a more energy exploration with a gasifier um, and bioethanol plants. And uh, I can tell you that now they're in the process of phasing out the large coal plant and switching to local biomass because they're also sensitive to some of the environmental questions that are in their region. So this has uh, grown so much um, and it's allowed so much to happen uh, at the local level. Here's another uh, very different example from India uh, we worked in an industrial park that had about 45 companies. Together, they were producing about <clears throat> excuse me, 900,000 tons of potential discards. Um, and the question was, what was being done with all those discards? So uh, let me show you that uh, there are, as in Collinborg, very different industries. Not just, you know, we're, we're all in the same pulp and paper system, or we're all in the same... Uh, uh, oil and gas system, but quite different companies. You see a sugar refinery, a coffee company, circuit boards, micro enterprises, and a large agricultural community in this part of India, in Karnataka. And we were the ones who came along and, and, and mapped what happened to the flows. We asked every company, what are your inputs? What are your outputs? Um, what, what are the quantities? What are the seasonality and so forth? And we put together this chart that these companies were actually doing an amazing job that was kind of hidden because no one had uh, you know, put it all together. And you see that there's just a lot of industrial symbiosis going on here. It almost looks like a food web with all the different uh, companies. Now, I want to say that it turns out that the sugarcane uh, refinery and the distillery are large facilities. And they were actually able to use their own waste products, you know, sugar cane and so forth, and burn that to make energy. So, so there's two things happening here. There's the reuse within a single facility, and then there's the reuse across facilities, the industrial symbiosis. Well, when we added this all up, what we found was that actually um, the, uh, there was quite a bit of... Um, Reuse, recycling going on. In fact, 99.5% of that 900,000 tons 
was being reused or recycled at least once. And that's the best result we've ever gotten, um, but it shows uh, the ability to close these loops in a, in a very uh, illustrative way. Let's look at another example. You may recognize Daisy. Uh, this is the second disassembly robot for Apple. It takes apart the phones. They use some of the first robot, Liam, uh, parts to make this one. And what this does actually is take apart uh, about 200 iPhone devices per hour, and it can remove and sort the components but here's the thing, the goal of Apple is to recover the materials that traditional recycling can't get. Um, so they can get a higher quality material um, and save money and also save availability because the materials that they use are, are in competitive use all around the world. So here they can start to create their own supply so that when times get tough, they can at least be keeping a little bit of their material on hand. Um, and so there's a lot of not only environmental opportunity here, but also business opportunity as well. This is something a little newer. It's a case study of a, a company in the UK that has made a, a phone app for used food. Now, look, how, do, how do we know that this so-called Tinder for food can work well, if you have a lasagna and you ate half of it and you want to somehow get rid of the other half and not put that on your waistline, you can post the, um, the offering to an app. Um, and you can see here uh, some of the examples. Uh, and so someone can come over and collect your app, your, your, their food, your food, and, make, and use, you can have that. And uh, it's a very interesting system that we've been studying in great detail. So um, I uh, just want to give you a sense of that. Uh, we're looking at networks, uh, who are the big givers, who are the takers? Um, is this a redistribution proposition? Is it a charitable proposition? Is it a sharing economy proposition? Um, and so we're doing, uh, we're learning a great deal about the fact that really people hundreds of thousands of entries we've, we're, we've analyzed. Um, we've looked at what foods are, are uh, exchanged the most. And this is another way of looking at a very different form of a supply chain in a very, with many, many, many different actors. Well, let's look a little bit more um, upstream. Uh, we've uh, seen, and also, how can we start to work on that reverse supply chain? And uh, Eileen Fisher is a great example. You can see that Eileen herself uh, uses the term a closed loop company so that they can uh, do this right straight through the system um, and upcycle. They're uh, very nice women's clothing made of natural materials and so forth. So uh, the way Eileen Fisher looks at this, there's a customer um, who gets a product and the product is a neutral color it hangs in the closet for a long time because it's high quality. And that's one way of uh, being more circular, keeping the good for a longer time, for more years. If it does need to re be repaired, you can see that there's help for that. Uh, there, you can, the good can be taken back and reused. And ultimately, this part isn't done yet, the, the clothing itself that can't, can no longer be used at all can be de-threaded. And this is a process that uh, you'll be hearing more about in years to come, getting right down to the thread and using that thread all over again. So how does a company like Eileen Fisher that's so busy following fashion trends and um, their concern and interest in fibers and so forth able to do all this work? Well, this slide tells us that they've taken back 800,000 pieces of clothing in the last 10 years. And these are the steps. So they take them in, if there's a spill, they can over dye it and maybe it'll look a little bit different, but it'll still be very uh, uh, attractive and usable. The mending that goes on, the re-sewing, 25% of the clothes, it, are, are, it says, are damaged beyond repair, and so they have to reconstruct those. The felting with some of the old clothing. And here's the, and here's the secret. They don't do this themselves. If you look at the website, you wouldn't know this, but they've actually employed a third party company called Yertle. And what Yertle does is they quietly sit behind uh, several companies now 
Um, and they are the ones who create the reverse logistics system. They're the ones who are um, hauling and, and sewing and resewing and so forth. Uh, and they, uh, they, they don't use their own name. So you can see their warehouse here. And a little bit more about Yertle We Commerce, interesting name. Um, and their work is a white label servicer. So that's exactly the kind of company I've described where um, the producer uh, is it's separate from the company that's doing the reuse, but they, they brand it to make it appear as uh, the lead company that, in this case, Island Fisher has done. Um, and Yertle uh, is the contractor that makes Eileen Fisher not have to be so concerned about how do I set up an online uh, take a, a store and take a picture of each good and how should we sell it and how should we return it and all those things are handled by Yertle WeCommerce. In the second bullet, you see that the uh, CEO of, of Yertle says that the resale space is growing at 25 times traditional retail and even, re and even e commerce five times uh, faster than um, e commerce. So, how interesting that this looks to be very appealing to the consumer and a, a solution for companies and their reverse supply chain. Let me give another example about a, a company that I'm involved with, TerraCycle. Um, they have reached another holy grail. They put, put a huge amount of effort into the loop program that would really is responsible for thinking through reusable packaging. They call this the milkman model. Um, just in the old days when you, uh, you would get milk for your children delivered to your house, and then when the bottles were empty, you'd put them out. The milkman could come and bring more bottles and take the empties. And that's the concept here. This was just uh, launched uh, in January at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And you can see that many companies have joined this. Um, the the Haagen-Dazs container on the right, um, the uh, uh, shampoo and, and Tide and so forth with very beautiful, new, elegant uh, containers. And these are the ones that come, in this case, from uh, UPS in a package, in a basket, and you can use them as you wish. When you need more, you put out the empties, the truck comes back and gives you what you've ordered in the online shopping system. And so it's using digital concepts. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more the system. Number one, the customer orders online. Then you see UPS actually delivering the product to the home. And this is in trials right now in, in France and in the US. And uh, the customer uses the product. The customer puts them aside into the containers. And um, the packages then are taken back, cleaned, and refilled. So an interesting loop um, and an interesting proposition. Let's see where that goes and see all the experimentation that's going on. So I want to wrap up. Um, I want to say that there are, is another important step in that, and, and how do you finance these programs? Um, where do the investors come from? Uh, and this last uh, slide says that there are these new organizations like the Closed Loop Partners, Circulate Capital. There are many, many financial institutions that are getting involved in this closed loop world, the circular economy of inventors and entrepreneurs. And uh, you can see how much can be accomplished through new business models, uh, market development, um, funding mechanisms, collection programs. All of these are part of the new adventure in uh, industrial ecology and circular economy. So uh, thank you. Here's some takeaways that I wanted to share with you and leave with you. As you see, um, there's uh, the pressure on the system is creating this need to be more resource sensitive. Uh, the circular economy and industrial ecology are concerned with this and, and are, are all about thinking of how to cycle products more using a lot of innovation. And uh, you also uh, see that the traditional notions of the supply chain that we talked about, uh, value chain from competitive strategy, supply chain from operations research are expanding to include the reverse logistic chains and reduce waste. I've left you with some examples. I'm sure you have many more and I hope you get to work with them. And finally, let me say thank you and keep calm and close the loop. <laughs> 
Thank you, Professor Chateau. Um, I'm gonna start with a few questions. I'm very curious to know if your father won the city council election. Ah, back when I was 10 years old and living in Syracuse, New York. Um, no, he lost. <laughs> but I wanna say that 10 years later, my mother ran in uh, almost the same position and she won. Yay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, do you think the traditional ideas of competitiveness and value chain can fully incorporate environment and sustainability? I think the question that you've asked is squarely on the table now. Can uh, the value chain, can uh, the supply chain fully incorporate environmental sustainability for companies? Companies have multiple duties the most uh, significant of which is to stay in business and to earn a profit. And occasionally there are certainly times when this comes into conflict with other social goals. On the other hand, I think what we're seeing out there is that much more can be done than probably a professor like me would have thought of 30 years ago. We had inspiration, we had interest, but now we're actually developing the technologies, the innovation, the ideas, that can help to instill and install these reverse supply chain ideas, um, the idea of uh, full supply chains and um, closed loop supply chains um, more directly into the processes. And I think that we're seeing so much activity in this area that I find it very encouraging. Thank you. Um, so when we, you were talking about industrial symbiosis, can these increase or decrease risk for individual companies? Another complicated question. Some people say if you locate companies together and um, they're all sharing resources, it could increase risk because the, if something came along, if the sea level rise was too high, if the storms are too fierce, you might put a lot of your company at risk. And, and, and this whole chain at risk. So that's what people are concerned about on the resilience side. I would counter that by saying there are so many advantages when companies cooperate, not only financially, not only logistically, and not only environmentally, but also creating bigger community. I think this really does expand boundaries. It does help people work together it does help people understand what's happening in the facility next door. And um, these types of uh, benefits are invaluable, um, intangible benefits that go along with the business benefits. You know, there's a question about whether this is really is a local supply chain and is that riskier or less risky than having a, a vastly spread out supply chain? Well, again, uh, you can look at it either way, but to me, the idea of saving on transportation, saving on raw materials, the opportunities that companies have day to day are a, you know, a powerful bulwark to the rare instance where you might have some kind of a resilience event. Okay, so now let's bring it to the individual level. So we talk about the supply chain and the companies, uh, but I would like to, to talk about, as an individual that cares a lot, I recycle. Um, but often it feels kind of unempowering, and I wonder if at that point where I am on the value chain, when I'm filling up my recycling bin, if that exercise is just basically mostly for me to not feel so bad about my consumption habits. And that has helped me to be a little more aware of the things that I need and do not need. So my question is, besides recycling, what do you recommend individuals uh, to do to support a circular economy? I think that you know, recycling, as you say, is a, certainly a symbolic beginning. There's some a churn in our U.S. markets right now, but uh, we know that for many years uh, we've been following the idea that recycling uh, should be done. What I think we're seeing now is just this enormous expansion. We're seeing entrepreneurial ventures and businesses we're seeing new types of policy that we hadn't imagined before and that individuals play a big role because they're the market. Are you willing to buy a remanufactured component for your truck as much as a, as a new one? 
Are you willing to understand how they're remade and therefore that they're as good as new? That's the standard in remanufacturing. Can they be as good as new? Can you, the consumer, uh, latch onto these habits and are you willing to follow what you often say you want to do? Now I think there's many more opportunities to actually do it. The idea that when this clothing, that my clothing is worn out and I can send it somewhere and that even at the end of its life, even if it's been through the Goodwill store and so forth, that there, even then we can preserve its value makes me so excited. I want to get clothes that we can be de-threaded and even the yarn, even the materials can be used again. I feel this way about everything I buy. You know, I want to know that uh, I'm not just uh, being acting lightly, but that we really are trying to reduce our food waste all these things take behavioral change, and we're the ones, we individuals are the ones whose behavior needs to change in order to make these successful, again, for environment, but also economically for companies. And um, oftentimes people from around the world ask me questions, you know, is the U.S., for example, getting behind? Is the U.S. really participating in the laws and so forth? And I say, I think the U.S., participates in different ways. I think we really do have the entrepreneurial spirit. And I don't think a day goes by where someone doesn't email me an idea for a new company, an article that came out in Green Biz about a new way to um, achieve a common goal. You see, for example, with the TerraCycle Loop program, this doesn't take um, a lot of time it just takes a new way of looking at the problem and rejoicing a little bit more in the high quality containers and the fact that they're being reused. I think these are part of our kind of individual decision-making continuum that will be the change. Much appreciated. Uh, thank you, Dr. Charteau, for being part of the series. Well, thank you, Erica. I'm so happy to be part of things and to talk about ideas I care so much about. And, and thank you for helping us understand better the interdependencies that surround the circular economy, all the way from the production and operations to sales and marketing, as well after the market and end of use. This is a space where all of us can participate, either through our jobs decisions or through our consumption habits. There can be many initiatives to address a circular economy, but it takes wide participation, collaboration, willingness, and for our actions to reflect our values. Thank you, and until the next one.